Good day learners, welcome to another lab for ComSci 132 Computer Architecture. In this lab, we're going to look into sequential logic elements or sequential logic circuits, which are actually components or circuits that store information. And uh, these sequential elements are used in uh, different uh, functional components when designing uh, a processor. Let's get started. Now, before we proceed with the discussion of the actual sequential elements, let us first start with the discussion of clocks. Now, clocks basically are important because it drives the execution of the processor. For example, when you buy a computer, usually uh, you need to uh, you need to specify the speed of the quote unquote speed of the processor, like uh, two point four gigahertz, something like that. And uh, that specification, that parameter, is related to clocks, which are used. To drive the execution of the so what are clocks clocks are needed in sequential logic to decide when an element that contains a state should be updated remember sequential elements contain information contain state when should the contents of that state be updated so it's the clock that drives that it is basically just a free running signal with a fixed cycle time or clock, fee, clock period. So it, uh, it's just a signal actually that changes uh, its value. And we call this cycle time and the cycle time, uh, the value of the signal changes from low to high or high to low. So that's basically the the mechanism of the clock this is shown in the figure in the slide so we have here uh, have here a clock period and the signal is the clock signal at a given period at a given time it is in a high value and at some given time it becomes low value so it actually alternates from low to high value it's called the high and this is the low and we define edge triggered clocking to mean that all changes in state elements occur on a clock edge so what do we mean by clock edge clock edge are nothing more than the transition from low to high or high to low if the transition uh, in this particular instantaneous period of time is from low to high this is called the rising edge and if the transition instantaneous transition is from high to low this is called the falling edge now the clock edge acts as a sampling signal causing the value of the data input to a state element to be sampled and stored in the state element meaning when this transition is detected then it is it is an indicator that the contents of the state element will be updated so the sampling is the sampling at clock edge is instantaneous and another requirement is that the signals that must be written into the state elements must be valid when the active clock edge occurs uh, so when you say a signal is valid, it means it is stable or not changing and the value will not change again until the inputs change. Okay? Now this is important because if the signal changes while being uh, fed back into the state element, then that will cause some inconsistency. Unlike in combinational circuit, this is not a problem because there is no feedback uh, mechanism. 
So state elements whose outputs change only after a clock edge provide valid input to a combinational block. So this is a typical configuration wherein you have a state element, then the output or the contents of the state element are fed into a combinational logic element. And then after the operation of the combinational logic element, the result is stored again to another state element and uh, the clock like this so starting at this point the value of the clock is low or zero and then at some point it transitions from low to high so this is a clock edge specifically a rising clock edge so that means the contents of the state element will be updated so during this period, the output, the contents of the contents of this state element is valid, and then so that during the computation within the combinational logic element is still valid. Then at, at this point, the clock signal changes from uh, high to low. So this is a falling clock edge, but we are talking about uh, positive edge triggering, meaning although this is a clock edge, the state element will not be updated because the updates will only happen when we have a uh, rising clock edge from high from low to high. So that is only the time when state element two will be updated. So what is the advantage of using an edge triggered methodology? Uh, the main advantage is that it allows the same state element to be used as both input and output in the same combinational block. So example you have this is both state in the previous figure this is both state element 1 and 2. So since we're using the uh, edge triggered blocking approach then we can use this as both the input and output of the same combinational block this is important when designing processor how do we implement clocks in vhdl so here is uh, an example code so uh, you can actually create uh, your own entity for the you can define a separate entity for a clock but normally the clock is uh, used in designing the te test bench because it drives the execution so as shown here uh, we have the I just labeled it as a test bench and then we specify the frequency so the frequency is the number of cycles per second so it's called uh, the basic unit of measure is called the hertz so we define the frequency the clock the uh, number of times uh, it change the clock signal changes per second to be uh, 100 megahertz the equivalent uh, value for 100 megahertz so and then we can uh, compute the the period which is actually the inverse uh, of uh, the frequency so one second divided by frequency that will give us uh, the period clock period and then a clock is nothing more than a signal type signal and initially set to zero or low then this is the main loop of this uh, test bench and what happens is to simply update the value of clock, negate it after, let's say in this example program, uh, half of the period. Meaning, uh, after half of the period, the original value of the clock will be negated. So it will loop continuously, so that will generate the clock signal. This is the code to test uh, the example code I have in the 
uh, GitHub repository. And uh, as you can see, here is the uh, sample uh, wave generated by that uh, clocker. So the period here is uh, 10 nanoseconds. We have uh, a frequency of uh, 100 uh, megahertz. Then the period, therefore, is 10 nanoseconds. And this is one uh, period. And this is uh, period over 2. So in the example code uh, shown previously, period over 2. So this is the transition from low to high. Then after half the period, there will be a transition again, high to low. So essentially, this is uh, what happens when uh, the clock is continuously changing uh, its value from high to low or low to high. Okay, so this is so this is the important thing to remember. This is the period, ten nanoseconds, and the change happens half of the period. Okay, so now that we're done with uh, the mechanism of clocks, we can now move on to uh, memory elements. Okay. Uh, memory elements are important also in designing a processor because they are used to store uh, the data being used by the combinational elements. In the previous topic, previous lab, we designed an ALU, and the ALU performs AND, OR, and ADDITION. Now, the operands, for example, used by the ADDITION instruction will come from some storage uh, structure. And that is where the memory elements come in, wherein these memory elements are actually composed of sequential elements well, there are three main uh, uh, it's actually divided into two parts the memory elements so the, we, we talk first about the uh, flip-flops latches and register remember that all memory elements store state and the output of any memory element depends both on the input and the value that has been stored inside the memory element so first let's start with the latch okay. so we have here what you call the set reset reset latch uh, usually when you say latches uh, these are unclocked storage elements memory elements meaning there is no clock input and as shown in this example implementation here so we have uh, Two NOR gates, and then you have the cross coupling of the elements. So, this is how we implement that in uh, VHDL. So, we have the reset and the set, set and set, and then the out there are two outputs, but normally you only use we only use one, the other is just the complement of the other output. So Usually, the main output being used is Q, and then Q bar is the complement of Q. So we have two outputs, uh, Q and Q bar. Now, take note of the type that we used here, in out. We used in out because it is for because these are these values are used for both as output and as input. In VHDL, we use this. Uh, and uh, we simply specify uh, the SR latch in this manner. So you have uh, Q is just uh, R, Q is just R, and then nor Q bar. Okay. So the simplest memory elements basically are unclocked. The Q is the value, Q is the value stored in the element, and Q bar is the complement. Uh, given Q is true, so if Q is true, or this is 1, 
when S is asserted, then Q will be asserted. So, this will be 1 okay, or two, true. <clears throat> when R is asserted, then Q bar will be asserted. So, kung 1 to originally, if we set S to 1, then this will become 1. If we set this to 1, then this will become 1 and this will become uh, 0. And no change will happen if we set this to 0. So you can experiment with the truth table by just analyzing the, the graph or, or the code. Okay? And you will be able to determine the output of the output Q and Q bar. So this take note that latches don't have clock inputs. Okay? Now what if uh, R and S are asserted simultaneously? Then that can lead to problems. So most of the time you don't assert, assert R and S uh, simultaneously. Now, I did not show uh, a waveform for the previous, uh, uh, for, for, the, for this latch. So, we move on to the next one, which is uh, a D latch. So, the previous one is called an SR latch, set reset latch. Now, this one here is called a D latch. Now, the D latch store information. So what is the difference between a clocked latch and a flip-flop? Okay. So SR latch is unclocked. Now D latch is clocked. It can be seen here by the value uh, C. C is the clock input and D is the data. So this is called a D latch, not a D flip-flop. Uh, this uh, latch, although it is clocked, it's still called a latch because a clock latch, uh, the state changes whenever the inputs, uh, inputs change and the clock is asserted. So meaning the inputs will change whenever the inputs uh, or whenever the, the state of the D latch will change whenever the inputs change and the clock is asserted. Now, compared to flip-flops, the state is changed only on the clock edge, not when the state, uh, not when the inputs change and the clock is asserted. So this is an example waveform. This is the clock. So initially the clock is uh, zero. Now this is the timing diagram. So at this point. The value of the data, the input, changed from uh, 0 to 1, for example. Now, the Q, the output, will not be affected yet because the clock is still in the uh, 0. So, it's not yet asserted. Only when the clock is asserted, so at this point, the clock is asserted, meaning the value of clock is set to 1. Of course, there will be some delays here. And only then that the output Q will be reflected. So, D here is 1. D here, uh, the Q here is 1. Then suddenly, the value of D changes from 1 to 0 at this point. Okay? What happens? Now, since the clock at this point is 0, not yet asserted, the value of Q bar will not change. When will it change? When the clock is asserted. So it is only after this, within this interval, that the Q bar will be uh, updated on the, uh, to reflect the value of D. So that is what we mean by the D latch. And the VHDL implementation is uh, like this. So it uses uh, uh, nor gates again and two end gates here but 
the D is negated on the first end shown here. Okay. So this is the D latch. Now let's move on to the next one, which is the D flip flap. Okay. So again, the main difference between the D latch and the D flip flap is that in the D latch, the state is updated when the clock is asserted and uh, yes when the clock is asserted and the, the input uh, change okay so that is a criteria for the change in the state again d latch is a clocked latch now d flip flop is a flip flop so the change will only be uh, reflected on the clock edge. Okay, so as mentioned, the output in flip flops will change only on the clock edge. And what is shown here is an implementation of a D flip flop using two D latches. So usually, uh, in some literature, I think in ComSci 130, uh, you call this the master and you call this the slave and this is the implementation for that so we implement here the uh, the d flip flop or dff for short using two uh d latches and this is the timing diagram so this is the clock initially low then at some point the value of the data changes so the output will not be reflected yet because this is not yet a clock edge now at this point at this point the clock changes from low to high okay? and since that is not the criteria uh, based on the timing diagram uh, based on the uh, circuit design here the, uh, the change will only happen during the falling edge part if we implement the d flip flop using two d latches then the update will happen only on the falling edge so at this point we have the falling edge here that's why the value of the output q is uh, updated based on the value of okay, so there is a transition here so moving on, at some point in time, the value of D changes, but the clock, uh, the clock is not yet on its edge. So whatever the current value of Q remains the same, and then uh, it will continue. Uh, the clock will continue uh, cycling until it reach another falling edge and it is only then that the value of q will be updated to reflect the input uh, d okay so the first latch called the master is open and uh, follows the input d and uh, when the clock input c is asserted so it will update this when the clock is asserted, but when the clock is not asserted, okay, uh, it will close the first, uh, the master, and then the slave will open and get the result. So here's a, a test bench uh, for the uh, D flip flop. Uh, Note that there are more efficient ways to implement uh, this D flip flop in VHDL. Uh, though at the structural level, this is how the D flip flop can be implemented using basically uh, two D latches. Here's a simpler code for the 
the flip flop so we have the data in we have the clock we have the reset the out this is a, this is what the typical implementation of the flip flop that you see in uh, the references on the web you have a reset uh, line if uh, the reset line is set then the queue is actually the queue will be zero and uh, this is a rising edge uh, setup so if the clock uh, is in its rising edge then simply allow the input to pass through very basic very easy compared to the one uh, shown earlier let's define uh, two terms here uh, when it comes to story storing inform uh, in storing data in a sequential element so we define setup time as the minimum time uh, that the input must be valid before the clock edge and the whole time is the minimum time that the input must be valid after the clock edge so this is the uh, we are talking about a falling edge timing this is a falling edge so this is called the setup time so at some point the input change okay? and this uh, is the clock edge that you are waiting for okay? so this is the setup time minimum time and then the data the, the input should maintain its value okay? within before it change called the hold time so, so this is the after the clock edge before the clock edge so the data should not change should not change uh, in this interval that's what we mean by uh, the signal is valid okay? the, the data the input will not change within this interval because uh, it will update only within uh, the clock edge while waiting for this clock edge to okay so we now move on to register files uh, register files uh, they consist of a set of registers that can be read and written by supplying a register number to be accessed example the example uh, earlier we have the al register so this is a typical uh, register file how does the register file work so the register files allows you to read and write data on the register so in this example register file we have uh, two inputs because let's say the design allows us to specify two register example would be uh, let's say we have an instruction move al DL. Okay. So these are register names and BL. Uh, this instruction actually means uh, move the contents of copy the contents of BL to AL. Okay. So in implementing this instruction, we need to specify, for example, two parameters here in the register file ALBL. Okay and the read register whatever the contents of al will come out here whatever the contents of bl will come out here and it's also possible to uh, store something on the register so you have to specify let's say a uh, move CL20. So move CL20. Uh, you can say this will be CL and this will be 20. So that's how you specify that. So now this is a control signal. It's colored blue. Uh, in the diagram that you see here, whenever the line is colored blue, that is a control signal. It's coming from a control unit. It says here to uh, write the value 20 and register CL. 
So that's how a register file works. So how do we design a register file? So the DFF, uh, D flip flop, can be used to implement the uh, register file. So the register file has two main operations to read the contents of the register and write to a specific uh, register. So let's look first at in the at the implementation of uh, the read on the register file. So this will be the somehow the low level implementation. So Within the register file, you have a set of registers. And each of these registers uh, are implemented using a D flip flap on DFF. So we have uh, an array of uh, D flip flaps. And then we have two multiplexers because in the design of uh, in the design of our register file, we allow uh, read for two registers, so we specify uh, two multiplexers, one for the first and one for the second register. So let's say this is uh, AL, DL, CL, DL. So if we specify AL here, then that is register zero then what will be out uh, what will be the output for read data or the value for read data will be al now if we set bl here okay so you have the links here so this will be the selector so the register number will act as the selector to the multiplexer that's why we have the read data so this is how the read is implemented in the register file. Now for the implementation of write, uh, for write implementation, it's, it's more complex. Again, when we want to write to a register, you have to, we have to assert, assert this is the control signal. We have to assert this and then we have to specify the where the register where we want to write to. So in the previous example, we want to write to CL and we want to write 20. So what will happen is the input CL will be uh, the input to an N to 2 to the N decoder. So N is the number of registers. So, uh, in our previous illustration, this is AL, this is CL, and this, this is, let's say, this is, this is CL. So, what will happen is the decoder, let's say, uh, uh, will output 2 here. There should be an end here, connecting the right, and then... going to have uh, the data here and we have the C here and we have the put here for the CL so this is our uh, illustration a while ago what will happen is the decoder given this input will uh, assert this line for CL, so this will be 1, and if you have write enable 1 here, this will be 1 also. So the clock input for the register for the DFF, so again, this is a D flip flop, will be asserted, we store uh, on the CL, and then what are we going to store on the CL? We have this data. So this is how we implement the register file. Okay? So we can integrate that into one to create the final register file. So let's have an example. Let's say we are uh, implementing a register file with two one-bit registers. How do we implement that? 
you can simply follow the same diagram. So I have here uh, an implementation. Okay. I have two versions. So this is the first version of the register file. Again, this is available in the uh, GitHub repository. And uh, it's fairly uh, complicated because we specify the different uh, components like the DFF for the register, which are actually just one bit uh, uh, D flip flop. Then we have the multiplexer to select uh, for which register to read uh, to or to pass through, to let pass through, and then the decoder, and then the AND gate. And then we essentially uh, wire them together to produce the final register file. But given that we have a hardware description language like VHDL with a rich set of syntax that allows uh, automatic uh, translation to uh, hardware by some algorithms you can simplify the implementation of the register file using some advanced uh, language features in the in VHDL so what do we mean by that so unlike in the previous uh, implementation wherein we wired a lot of components together here uh, we can note of we, can, we actually made use of an array the array is uh, just uh, an array of bits that represent the flip-flops or the registers themselves so instead of having a a dff component just use an array to act as the registers and then we process uh, based on the clock if it is the rising edge and the right enable is asserted then we can just index the registers which is actually an array of bits and simply write the data wherein write n will just be the index the index on the register on this register array otherwise if it is not then you simply return the uh, values by accessing the registers array and we have read data and uh, read, read data one and read data two as you can see, the interface is the same. The interface for our uh, register file is still the same. But our implementation is uh, much simpler because we took advantage of the uh, rich or advanced features of a VHDL. Okay. So in implementing the in implementing the in implementing the processors or in designing processors, uh, the register file is uh, treated as one uh, functional component. And the main advantage of the using registers is that it's actually faster. Now we move on to the next memory element, which are called uh, SRAMs and DRAMs. Again, uh, SRAM are called uh, static random access memory. And uh, to access a memory, you need to specify an address. It has a, uh, the st static RAM has a specific configuration in terms of the number of addressable locations and uh, width of each addressable location. So you have uh, when you design a RAM, you have to specify the number of uh, addressable locations and the width, or 
uh, the size of each ad addressable location. As you can see in the example, uh, we have a 2M, uh, 2 million by 16 SRAM. This means that 2M is the height or the number of addressable locations and 16 is the width or uh, the number of bits per addressable unit. So in this example, we have 16. So what we mean by that is this is uh, 21. The input is uh, 21 bits. Okay? So you can uh, address 2 to the 21 give you about 2m 2m uh, addressable lines and then each one is uh, each addressable uh, line here is 16 bits in length so this will be 0 1 2 3 and when you use that in the address line then you get this entire uh, 16 it's given this configuration so in this configuration we have uh, 21 address lines uh, three control lines and uh, 16 data inputs and 16 bit uh, output so these are the control lines that tells us uh, what we want to do to initiate or read or to initiate a read or write access, the chip select signal must be made active. So if you want to read or write, you have to assert this uh, chip select control signal. And if you are reading from the memory, we must also activate the output enable signal. So let's say uh, we want to read something from the from the static from this static RAM. We need to set chip select one and then output enable one also uh, the output enable is useful the output enable is useful for connecting multiple memories to a single output bus and using output enable to determine which memory drives the bus so uh, if you have a lot of memory then you sample uh, when you buy a computer you actually have uh, given uh, Set of RAM, then you can buy memory stick. You can buy another memory stick and then plug it in. They share the same bus and uh, can select which one uh, to use when writing to the memory. Now, for writes, we must supply the data to be written in the address. So, this is the if you want to write something in the RAM, static RAM, you have to specify the data in the D in. Okay? And uh, of course, the chip select must be true, and then the uh, write enable must also be true, and the data is written on the specific uh, memory or in the, in the specific uh, cell. Okay, so that is uh, static RAM, the mechanism for static RAM. In the register file, we have to specify register numbers in the static ram we have to specify address addresses okay, because we have a specific configuration shown here now in latches and flip-flops we use multiplexers to choose the output remember in the design of the in the design of our uh, register uh, register file we use multiplexers so normally in uh, in a processor you have a limited number of registers that you can use and uh, you can use a multiplexer for that however if you have uh, a ram with uh, a very large uh, range of addresses for example in this example we have 21 bits then uh, it's not uh, cost effective to use uh, multiplexers. Okay? 
Uh, rather than uh, use a large uh, multiplexer, a large, uh, large memories are implemented with a shared output line called a bit line. So this is called the uh, it's called the bit line. So notice that this line is shared by uh, different uh, components here. Okay. So all, this line can be asserted by each of these memory memory cells. Okay. This, this, this each of these contain our memory cells which contains data, and they can assert simultaneously this uh, this line. So to allow multiple sources to drive a single line, so it may not be feasible to do that if we don't implement what we call a three-state buffer, right? Or the tri-state buffer. The purpose of that, of course, of the tri-state buffer is to allow uh, this bit line to be shared. If the output enable, the output enable, these are the output enable, Lines. If the output enable line is asserted and is otherwise in a high impedance state that allows another three state buffer whose output enable is asserted to determine the value of a shared output. So all of this uh, can assert okay, this line and Instead of just having one or zero, we can have we have another state called uh, high impedance state. So which is the third state. So that's why it's called a three state buffer. So that will allow us to determine which memory cell will pass through. By using three state buffers uh, in the individual cells of the SRAM, each cell that corresponds to a particular output can share uh, the same output line. And usually, uh, these uh, enable lines or these components, three state component, are already integrated into the design of the flip flops. Let's have an example here. We have the 4x2 SRAM. It's a small 4x2 SRAM. Uh, might be built using D latches with an input called enabled that controls the three state output. So, originally, when we designed our uh, D latches, we only have uh, these components. But if we're going to use uh, D latches in implementing an SRAM, we need to have an enable uh, line included in the design of the D latches that will control okay, that will control this uh, three state or tri state buffer because uh, their output share a common bit line. So take note that the important thing to remember here is that instead of using multiplexers to select the output we use a three state buffer for SRAM. Now to further uh, improve the design of SRAM remember that uh, in order to select in order to select the specific uh, word, okay? we call this a word, word size in the memory cell, we need to use a decoder to, de uh, to determine the, the exact location. And if we have something like this, 21 bits, that's quite, uh, it will be very uh, a big decoder. So instead of having a very big decoder, uh, we use a two-step decoding for SRAMs. So, if you are to implement uh, 4M by 8 SRAM, meaning uh, the address line has 21 bits and uh, 8 bits per, per row or word size SRAM, 
can implement them by, as an array of uh, 4K by 24 arrays to reduce the size of the decoder, but we have to use uh, two steps. So the first decoder generates the address for the 8 4K by 1024 array. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. This is the first decoder. We'll, uh, so normally the, the address is split into two parts. This is the first half of the address and it's the second half uh, upper bits of the address. And then it is used as uh, an, to generate the index okay, for, the, for this. Then uh, a set of multiplexer is used to select one bit from each uh, 1024 wide array. So the output here is uh, 1024. So you select one bit from that for this address and you get the desired number of bits for that particular line. So it uses two steps. So the first one, uh, this you have the decoder here, and then you just use the multiplexer as the output for this 4K by 1024S. Okay. So I hope that's clear. Now the next one is dynamic RAM. Okay. Now static RAM, uh, the storage. Uh, Technology uses D latches as shown in the previous illustrations. Now, in dynamic RAM, the value is kept in uh, a cell. Uh, the value kept in a cell is stored in a capacitor. A single transistor is then used to access this stored storage, either to read the value or overwrite the charge stored there. So, uh, it uses, only, it uses only a single transistor per bit, thus you have a cheaper than SRAM. Because normally, I think uh, the SRAM will require more transistors per bit. So because DRAMs store the charge on a capacitor, it cannot be kept indefinitely and must periodic, periodically be refreshed. So refreshing would mean just reading it back, uh, reading it and then writing uh, it back. Now, similar also to the SRAM, DRAM uh, uses two-level uh, decoding. So please note again the main difference between uh, SRAM and uh, DRAM is that in the DRAM, you have to refresh the, the storage because the, the, the data is stored in capacitor and capacitor uh, will lose uh, its charge after a few, a few, uh, a certain amount of time, so it has to be refreshed. So you read it and then write it. Unlike in the, unlike in the SRAM, wherein you have the clock that is uh, 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 that triggers the storage, and once the data is stored, it remains there. However, the implementation requires more number of transistors. So here we have uh, an example illustration of uh, four uh, four M by one DRAM. Okay. So four M. This is the height and this is the width. So uh, again, the address line is uh, of size twenty one bits. So what happens in a level decoding decoding scheme okay so we have uh DRAM use a two level decoder consisting of a row uh, access followed by a column access so two step access the row and then access the desired column the row access uh, uses one of the number of rows and activates the corresponding word line so this is the row decoder and then uh, the row decoder will uh, specify the desired row then that entire row is copied to the column latches and then 
the multiplexer will uh, return the will select the final output. Uh, the contents of all the columns in the active row are then stored in a set of latches, right? And the column access uh, the column access then selects the data uh, from the column latches. So first you start with the uh, decoder uh, for the, the row. Uh, you specify that in the row decoder, then that entire row, let's say this row is copied to this column latches. First, there will be columns here, so three, and the multiplexer will, let's say, will select this, that will be the output. A pair of signals called row axis strobe and column axis strobe are used to signal the DRAM that either a row or column axis is being supplied. So you just have a, a specific, a single uh, uh, variable line here, address, that uh, determines whether it's using the row decoder or it's using the column selector. That's why it's only have uh, 10 here. So it reuses some components. Okay, so I guess uh, that uh, focuses uh, that uh, those topics are uh, the main uh, concepts that you need to learn about uh, sequential elements when it comes to the their storage capabilities. So, so far, we have discussed. Uh, Latches, uh, flip flops, uh, register files, SRAM, and lastly, DRAM. So we move on now to the next uh, interesting topic, which is called uh, finite, finite state machines. Okay. What are finite state machines? So a sequential system cannot be described with a truth table can't uh, uh, do that so instead we use a uh, finite uh, state machine so a finite state machine has a set of states and two functions called the next state function and the output function so these are the key elements in a finite state machine we have the state and the next state function and the output function now the set of state corresponds to all the possible values of the internal storage and the next state function is a combinational function that given the inputs and the current state determines the next state of the system the next state function is a combinational function, it's a combinational circuit. Okay? And the output function produces the set of outputs from the current state and the inputs. Okay? So that's basically a state machine, a definition of the same. I think in 130 you you've been you discussed this also. And uh, in digital design, we have two types of machines. We have the uh, finite state machines. We have the Moore machine, where in the output function is dependent only on the current state, and the Mealy machine, the output function is dependent on the current state and the current input. But uh, the discussion, our discussion, will focus on the Moore machine, where in the output function is dependent only on the current state so this is the diagram for the finite state machine so you have a set of inputs again the three this this state machine has three main components we have the current state we have the net state function and we have the output function now the current state uh, is driven by a clock okay and the state is an input to the output uh, function and the inputs also uh, is an input to the output function and then the next state function 
uh, the inputs are the current state and the inputs. Two inputs here. As, as mentioned earlier, the next state function uh, determines the next state of the system. So based on the input and the current state, it will generate the in, the next state function will generate the next state and the output function produces a set of outputs from the current state in the input. so then you have the specific output so given those definition let's look at an example of uh, implementing a simple traffic light uh, the code for this is also in the github repository so you can check it out actually part of uh, your activities is to try out the codes that are uploaded so let's define let's design a traffic light so of course i'm sure every one of you uh, is familiar with uh, traffic lights so when designing the traffic light uh, we have the say, north, south, east, west. So there, if you are here, you have the traffic light here, traffic light here. Okay. So first we define the outputs. Uh, the outputs uh, is uh, the first one is the n is light. Uh, when this sig signal is asserted, the n is light signal, the light on the north south road is green. When this signal is asserted, the light on the north south road is red. Then uh, and EW light is when this signal is asserted, the light on the east west road is green uh, when the signal is deserted and the light on the east west road is red so two outputs so these are the two outputs for our tape machine so the inputs will be the NS, ns car and ew car ns car indicates that a car is over the detector placed in the road bend road bed in front of the light on the north sound road north south road and the ew car sensor indicates that a car is over the uh, the detector placed in the road bed in front of the light on the east west road going east or west okay, so you have uh, sensors here sensors here sensors here sensors here so this will be the inputs to our uh, uh, state machine. Now for the states of the traffic light, we define two states. We have the N is green. The traffic light is uh, green in the north-south direc north direction and EW green the state when the traffic light is green in the east-west direction so we now move on so we specify the inputs the outputs uh, the state and now we define the next state function in our diagram the next state function will determine the next state based on the current state and the input so we specify this using a truth table so we have two states n is green and ew green then we also have the, the inputs the ns car and ew car if the current state so this is the current state the current state is green and ns car is zero and the ew car is zero then uh, let the ns green state remain the same so that's the next state still ns green if ns green is uh set current state and then ns car is zero then 
there is a car in the east-west line, then the EW, uh, the EW green will be the next state. Now, if we have the current state as N is green, and then we have a car uh, in the uh, north-south line, and no uh, east-west, no car on the east-west line, then we remain. The state of the traffic light is remains the same, N is green. What if uh, the current state is green, uh, N is green, and there is a car in both the north south and uh, east west so we set the uh, east west team so you get the pattern so you specify the behavior or the state of the system or the traffic light based on the current state and the inputs to determine the next state so this will be our uh, next state function so how do we define now the output function? So again, the output function okay, will generate the outputs uh, NS light and EW light because we've defined the, those R's as the output. So this will be the, uh, the inputs. Uh, what are the inputs for the output function? it will require the current state and the uh, uh, inputs also so we can specify this uh, basically it, uh, the output function current state if the current state is n is green okay we set the n is light to one if the current state is ew green then we set the EW light output as 1. So we have uh, specified our traffic light, uh, the design of our uh, traffic light system, simple traffic light system. So we can also visualize the traffic light system using a graphical representation. So this is the graphical representation of our uh, finite state machine for the traffic light. So the nodes are used to indicate the states. So this, our states are N is green and EW green. In the node, we place a list of the outputs that are active for that state. So if the state is N is green, is our output N is light. If our state is EW green, we place inside the node the output, which is EW light. Directed arcs are used to show the next state function, which label, uh, with labels on the arcs specifying the input condition as logic functions. We have logic functions. So let's say you have your current state is N is green, and then <clears throat> The in, uh, input EW card is set, then the transition, there will be a transition from N is green to EW green. Okay? So take note that uh, to do this, you need to analyze. You need to analyze the next state function okay? uh, using uh, logical Boolean algebra or uh, the typical techniques that you do for combinational elements. Okay. Uh, the transition from N is green to EW, uh, EW green in the next state table is, uh, okay, so this is a simplified version because what is done actually here is you have to examine the table and uh, you need to, for example, the transition from uh, N is green to EW green. This will be N is green to EW green. N is green to EW green. So these are the two terms that you are important to the transition. So if you represent this 
boolean expression this will be uh, not n scar not n scar because this is zero then and ew car then or uh, n scar and ew car so if we represent this as the transition from n is green to w then we can have something like not uh, n s scar and ew car So using sum of products of n s car and e w r but we can simplify this we can simplify this expression and simply have this simple uh, uh, expression which will trigger the transition from n s green to e w green right so this is actually uh, a better view of uh, the uh, finite state machine because you have a graphical representation so when we design when we eventually design this uh, traffic or when we implement this traffic light uh, example okay these are the steps that we uh, need to take so first we need to assign number assign number uh, assign some numbers to states for example in the previous diagram we can assign zero for the green state and then uh, e ns green state and we can assign one for the ew green state and the next state function will be uh, not the current state and ew car or the current state and not ns car so this will determine the next state okay so we have uh so we've done with the we're done with the state assignment okay so the the next one is the current uh the computation okay the computation of the next state so we can uh, the next state is based of course on our uh, next state function so this will be our our uh, formula for that okay so this will be the computation and then uh, the output will be and it's light not current state and ew light will be the current state so when we design when we implement this finite state design okay, these are the main uh, uh, things that we need to uh, consider so we assign number to states then we specify the next state what will be the next state and then we define the we also specify the output so this will be the somehow the block diagram for that so you have a state register here so here is the vhdl code for that okay so we have the inputs uh, ew car and uh, ns car and of course we have the clock that drives the you remember our diagram of the clock here and this will be the process block okay so n is light is not state so state is the current state here so we have the state variable So N is light is not state and EW light is the state. And then we up if it is the rising edge of the clock, then uh, we check the value of state. If state is zero okay, and EW car is set, then the state becomes 
uh, one meaning es uh, green okay. so there are a lot of simplifications in this uh, this code uh, we did not uh, use the state variables ns green and ew but we can actually do that we can define a type uh, for that but this one actually makes it simpler because ew car represents as the same value as uh, ew green so we simply assign the state to the value of ew car when the state is zero and then state when state is one I, uh, we simply assign the n is car to the state so to make things simpler but uh, you can actually implement this by adding the by specifying the actual states uh, n is green and ew green so this will be our test bench for the uh, for the traffic light simulation or simulator so we have the components here uh, we have the clock then of course we need to have the proper uh, port mapping and or the this is the component for the traffic light and eventually we'll have this uh, test bench so this is the clock okay the clock signal and then the state uh, again when uh, if state is zero if the state is zero that will be n is green if the state is one that will be ew green so at this point uh, it is uh, state is n is green okay and then uh, during the progress the progress uh, ew car is set to one okay however it's not yet the falling edge uh, the rising edge uh, part of the falling edge part of the of the clock so the n is light uh, the ew light is not yet asserted okay and then if we have this clock edge okay and then uh, there is a car then it's only the time when the ew light is asserted so this is an example uh waveform for the simulation of the traffic light now what is the importance of this in uh, CPU design or processor design. Uh, the main uh, importance of uh, finite state machine in the design of processor is that the state of the computation or the execution of instruction can actually be represented as a finite state machine which is uh, used in the design of the control unit for example uh, as i mentioned before that the execution can actually be divided into five stages instruction fetch instruction decode execution uh, memory store memory access and then write back so each of these uh, stages can be represented as states and this can be used to drive the execution of the instructions in processor so i hope uh, that uh, uh, the discussions uh, in this lab has covered the uh, sequential elements as well as clocks and uh, finite state machines which are essential in the design of a uh, processor Thank you very much.